Good morning, and welcome to Monday Morning Milk. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Todd, and I am joined today by the president and CEO of the YMCA Greater Springfield, the man, the myth, the legend, Dexter Johnson. Thank you for coming. It's glad to be here. Yeah. Um, so before we get into things and start talking about some of the things we discussed, tell me a little bit about this rumor about the great DJ, Funk Master Dex. <laughs> well, you know, I, I really came from a musical family. Um, my father was a singer, um, big into gospel, um, grew up on my mother's side of the family, um, bands, you know, grew up in the 70s. So. Nice. You know, Earth, Wind and Fire, Commodores, Ohio Players type music um, was it was just great being in those environments. So I quickly learned I didn't have the musical skills like that, um, but I just really enjoyed the music. And so uh, one of my early jobs was working at a record store and just learning so much about different types of music and just kind of became this encyclopedia of music. And so later on in my it's probably in my, my 30s, I decided to open the DJ business and, Fantastic. you know, really more of a wedding type DJ versus okay. a mix master scratch type okay. DJ um, <laughs> that right. I did when I was, was 18 years old. So, yeah. uh, but, you know, everyone always said, well, you should be on the radio. You should, okay. you know, you, you should get on the radio and you've got that, that voice like, you know, with Quiet Storm with DJ the DJ, 12 Q105. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that wasn't my calling. So okay. okay. So were you inspired by Kid Capri and those guys like that? Or um, well, you know, I'm I'm the first hip hop generation, you know, Rapper's Delight came out. I was in yeah. sixth grade and and so I, I grew up with that. Um, but but no, when I when I became a DJ, that was um really more of doing the the wedding thing and okay. thinking of it more as a as a business and a, a chance to, you know, get, get people moving on the floor. Fantastic. Fantastic. So flashing forward, um, CEO and president of YMCA Springfield. Absolutely. So, so 30 years with the Y. Fantastic. So um, how long have you been at Springfield Y? So I've been here for 10 years now. Okay. And walk me through a little bit of your, your journey here so far. Just in Springfield specifically? Yeah, yeah, Springfield specifically. So, you know, when I arrived here, um, a previous CEO re recruited me to, to come here. We'd actually worked together down in Florida. Um, and I'd I'd gone off and done the, the National YMCA um, thing, doing some consulting work with them and really wanted to get back into the heart of operations and serving people directly. So um decided to take him up on his offer and and move to springfield even okay. after being a lifelong floridian and brave mm -hmm. the, the new england weather and um do something different so i've been the the ceo now for going on five years okay um yeah. since i i took over uh running the ship and so you know lots of changes obviously we've just finished a, a pandemic which no one expected and um a move from a previous location but it's been a fun ride for sure. Yeah. So what would you say that your biggest challenge has been in your time since you've been here? Well, that that would definitely be it. No one could have ever projected, oh, cl close the doors for the first time in yeah. in decades yeah. um, of your entire operation. So, you know, our, our operation has three primary components, you know, the health and wellness mm -hmm. side of the Y, the child care side of the Y, and then our, our teen programming. So with with all of that being sh shut down mm -hmm, immediately mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know it was a, a shock to the system yeah and um you know we were fortunate enough to to reopen the child care operations after about a week of being closed because we knew we really needed to support the the essential workers out of there you yeah, know the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the hospital staff the emergency workers factory workers all of those folks that would still need child care even while most businesses were closed down so yeah, i was glad yeah. to be able to do that that's fantastic um, but it was definitely a trying time figuring out how to keep a, a business viable um, in the midst of a shutdown. Yeah. So how do you think that you adjusted your leadership style mm -hmm. to fit that, to fit those needs? Right? Yeah. Well, you know, I had a big learning out of it. You know, I, I was the type of person who, you know, in 
in trying to have that ownership, I was the the person who yep, I'm at work every single day. And mm -hmm. no, you, you can't close the Y down for any reason. Yeah, and yeah, yep, yeah. it's snowing outside and, it, you know, you have to be here and and I have to be here. And the, the pandemic kind of opened the eyes to realize, yeah. you know, it's, it's going to be OK if you have to to make make certain decisions, whether that's having time for yourself and and um, really having that work life balance. Absolutely. Um, and the way we operate is that understanding of, yeah, I think we'll survive. We'll be yeah. OK. Um, and I, I, I would tell people this all the time in the past, but I had to learn it for myself through that process. The, the why will be OK. It was here before I got here and yeah. it'll be here after I leave. And um, it, it will, will be OK to take some time for yourself. Absolutely. You know, it's it's funny because one of my you know, and I've only been working with the Y for a little bit, but one of my first um, interactions that I had with now a former employee, he was talking about you as a leader. Mm -hmm. And he said, during the pandemic, you were here, mm -hmm. you know, and it was such a good example that I got of the why, mm -hmm. you know, and, and um, you as a leader, you, uh, or more so what the why stood for in the community as well. Um, so I wanted to pass that on. I don't know if you know anything about that. But, no. Um, so I think as, uh, you know, we were talking about that, um, do you think that you have been or the why has been responsive to the needs of the community or have, have you met any challenges with those, you know, with that? Yeah, you know, that's the, the trick of nonprofit community service work is what meeting the needs of the community. That's that's yeah. the only reason that um, not for profits exist is to to fill gaps that yeah. the, the government can't necessarily fill. Yeah. Um, and so. You know, a, a city, a community like like Springfield, just like any other large city, is going to have its its different needs. You're mm -hmm. going to have you're going to deal with poverty. You're going to mm -hmm. deal with homelessness. You're going to have the needs for childcare, um, health and well being, mental health and well being, um, food shortages. All of those things are are things that impact any large city, mm -hmm. and, and then even now filtering into to smaller communities. Um, and so the the trick is always. Every organization also can't do everything. Yeah. You can't yeah. try. Anyone who tries to do everything finds out they're not doing a very good job at, at any of it. Absolutely. And so we have to be um, really aware of that and have that understanding that let's let's fill the gaps where we can be really excellent at filling the gaps. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. not try to fill every gap. Where where are the community partners that we could work with when we have someone who presents a problem? Um, that's not really our forte or mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. have the skill set for mm -hmm. who's the community partner that we can refer them to. Mm -hmm. um, so every few years we do a strategic planning process mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you're really gathering information from the community and figuring out what, what are the biggest needs? What are the things that are on people's minds? Mm -hmm. um, and do we need to change our services? Do we need to alter anything to, to help deal with that or mm -hmm. Do we feel someone else out there is already really doing a good job with that and mm -hmm. maybe they just need help in, in spreading that service? Absolutely. So, you know, I've been working in uh, human services for a long time. And uh, one of the prevailing issues out there is staff burnout, mm -hmm. you know, and especially for frontline staff, especially for the, the staff that are in the muck and mire on the day to day. How does the why address that? Mm -hmm. or yeah, you know, staff burnout. When you you have a staff, when your your job is caring for people. So you know, while I've never been in the medical field, I'm sure it it's a very similar thing. You've mm -hmm. spent all your time, all in your effort, trying to make things better for the people that you're taking care of. Yeah, yeah. And you forget to to put that mirror in front of you and make sure that that you're doing the same for yourself. It's hard. Yeah. Um, and how do you create that balance? Because most of those types of jobs, the, the medical field, our field, they're not nine to five worlds. Yeah, they they yeah. are. They take a lot of time. Um, and even when you're not at work, it's not something that you can just turn a switch, you turn that off, and now you're not thinking about those types of things anymore. Yeah. Um, so, you know, organizationally, I think it's important to get the message out that we as the why, as the leadership of the why, aren't having that expectation. I know mm -hmm. you may you may have been at a job before where where that was the expectation mm -hmm. that you that you spend seventy hours at work and you take all the work home mm -hmm. with you and mm -hmm. you keep you keep going, keep burning and keep churning. Mm -hmm. And so organizationally, while I, I can't 
necessarily change that if that's just who you are and the way you like to do things. I like to make sure that it's understood that that's that's not what we're asking you to do. We are, we are asking you to um, have that work-life balance. I, I know for a fact in our administrative office, um, our CFO literally tells one of her staff people that don't, he'll just come to work every day, the whole mm-hmm. year, mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. the vacation time's gone, yep. and that yep. won't, he may take two days off a year. She will mandate, yeah. you need to go for a week, yep. not, not yeah. a day, not to go for a week. You are um, you have to force the work-life balance mm-hmm. for some folks mm-hmm. um, just because that's, that's just how they're wired. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, again, as a why, as the example in the community, I think people appreciate that continuity in culture, mm-hmm. you know, and appreciate the fact that this is the why, this is where we work. And again, I've been only working here for a little while, but I do appreciate that, that that's ingrained in, in my work life, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so I know that uh, we had talked before about you reading with the kids, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the preschool and stuff. So, um, as our last questions, last thought, um, what's your favorite book to read with the kids? Yeah, you know, people wonder, well, why, are you, why are you down there so often? Well, that, that is the side of the why that I came through. So, you right. know, with those different arms of the why that I mentioned, um, I started in, in child care. After right. school right. programming yeah. was my, my first job at the Y 30 years ago um, as I was planning to, to become an elementary school teacher at the time. Okay. And... Um, so it's it's why I enjoy that that group. It, you know, you really love the energy that you get back from the kids, and why I enjoy um, spending some time with them. Um, for me, I'm uh, you know, when it's just so happens to have moved to Springfield, I had no idea when I was on the way here that this was the home of of Dr. Seuss. But yes, yes. Um, I've always been a Dr. Seuss fan. Yeah. So yeah. you know, even when I lived in Florida, Green, green Eggs and Ham yeah. was, was yes. um, <laughs> you know, that tends to be my, my go to. If I have a short window or a group with a short attention span, you yeah. know, a three or four year old, um, for for me, my favorite one is actually the the Lorax. You know, I, I yes, I like stumbled the, through that the messaging yeah. of it, and you know, really getting even young people to think about the the big picture. You mm-hmm. know, that mm-hmm. that's really the moral of of that story, and kind of how the the difficulty of sometimes the quick decisions and the quick mm-hmm. buck um, isn't really the best for the the big picture. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so um, when I'm dealing with, you know, elementary school kids that are a little older, I, I like the Lorax, but mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. it's hard for a four-year-old to sit all the way through the Lorax. So I, I usually stick with, with the quick green eggs and ham for them. Fun. Good. Well, good Dexter, um, as our, you know, first guest for our Monday morning mocha, I'm very grateful for you. I'm grateful to you as a leader, as an example. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really grateful. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, thank you for our listeners for joining us as well. And un- until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.